he sent me a message and said, hey, I want to give towards the PAD project. I believe in this. And so can you help me make that happen? And so he's giving me, you know, the equivalent of $5, but to them, that's a, a that's probably the equivalent of 50 to a hundred dollars for somebody in the U S you know, on a regular salary. And he doesn't even have an income and yet he's giving towards this program. And so, um, you know, it's not just foreigners trying to do things in these countries either. This is somebody from within his own country that wants to help and didn't have a way to do it didn't know about it, didn't have a platform and wants to give. And so we're gonna make that happen for him. Well, like they call everything mouse here, you know, and you're like, what's that? They're like mouse. And you're like, that's not a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> the size of like a cat or a kitten probably kitten. wow i mean like bigger than a nepal kitten but like a u.s kitten size because they're you know they're they're big wow and they so just call them all cute. they actually most of them are cute like they have kind of mouse faces they're just like enormous mice and so they're really cute they're not like you know like sewer rats and you know they have those too but the ones in your house are really kind of cute. And if they weren't so destructive, you'd want to let them live. But yeah. <laughs> well, Corinne, I really appreciate you taking the time to meet. Um, want to learn a bit more about your story. Can you tell me where you're coming from and then where you are currently? Yeah. So originally I was from Lawrence, Kansas. And currently I live in Nepal. I live in two places in Nepal. Sometimes I am in Kathmandu, which is where I currently am on lockdown. Um, and the rest of the time I live in a remote village about nine miles from the Tibet border up north. And Kansas and uh, Kathmandu, they're very similar, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there's cows in both places. But in Kathmandu, they're on the road in the middle of the city. And in Kansas, they're in the field. So slightly different. <laughs> wow. And what caused you to move from... Kansas to Kathmandu? Oh, that's a good question. Well, um, I actually got in, started getting into relief work after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And in six years, I'd done 11 trips home and abroad. And I realized that this was something that I should do with my life and not just my vacation. So I started looking at opportunities. There was a hospital in the far west of Nepal um, at that time that I thought I was going to work at. So I came to visit. But at that time, I actually got a heart for justice issues like human trafficking and girls and women's empowerment, gender issues, um, inequality issues, abuse issues, et cetera, and decided to come here. Um, the hospital opportunity actually ceased to be an opportunity before I came. So I reevaluated and decided I wanted to come and do programs more focused on human trafficking prevention marginalization and exploitation prevention, girls and women's empowerment, et cetera. So that's what I did. Wow. Um, I'm going to have some questions on that. Six foot. Okay. Nice. In my socks. Yeah. Which in <laughs> Nepal is great because everything, all the doorways are about five and a half feet. <laughs> so at uh, one point I had a bruise on my forehead from my doorway in my house in the village. And I had a bruise on my shins from where my legs hung over my bed. And I was like, the average height of, the, of a Nepali is somewhere between the bruise on my forehead and the bruise on my shin. So, okay, how's that height? That is beautiful. It's perfect. You're great. And if I sit back, is it still okay? Let me move it a little yep. closer. Okay. Um, and also, I get you with the height. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just about 6'1". Uh, and when I was living in Taiwan, I was like, everything short <laughs> and I can only imagine my brother my younger brother who's six five uh spent the past two years living in India and he was just talking about how he sticks out like a sore thumb uh, it's just miserable and things like buses and public transportation and like you know there's just nothing is made for these limbs and these heights so it's tricky oh <laughs> <laughs> we they appreciate have it. a set of doors here the Nawaris especially their doorways are like three feet high because when their dead ancestors will come back home but they can't duck 
evidently the spirit of your dead ancestors can't duck. So they can't get in the house if your doorway is short. Mm. So just so well, you know. Well, if they couldn't, that would be a great tactic. <laughs> right? <laughs> you knew that's all it took. Okay. So, so um, <laughs> you, uh, you moved to Nepal. The hospital wasn't an option. How long ago was that? I did my, I call it a vision trip to come and see kind of what life would be like here in 2012. Um, and in 2013 was when I was on my way kind of here, getting ready to come, putting my job, selling my stuff, getting everything ready. And that's when the hospital turned over to the government and was no longer available as um, an option for a foreigner to work. So I came to Nepal January of 2014. Um, but not at that point with the intention of going to the hospital. Wow. And what was one of the first things that struck you by, for the Nepali people? The Nepali people are the most hospitable, friendliest people on this entire planet, I think. So that is the one thing that makes Nepal worth living here because it's a very difficult place to live. Um, you give up pretty much all of the conveniences you're used to and all of the normalcy all of the processes that work, <laughs> you know, those are things that don't, don't um, exist here. But the people are amazing and you fall in love with them almost immediately. And then after that, the rest, you know, you kind of settle in, culture shock goes away and um, it, becomes, it becomes a really enjoyable place to live. But you have to have a really great sense of humor and a great sense of irony and be amused by things that are out of, outside the norm. If you were a real little literal person, this would be a nightmare um, to live here. Speaking of nightmare situations, you recently described um, some challenges with little creatures. Uh, one that particularly was musical. Um, <laughs> others that were furry. <laughs> um, you, you say life is really difficult. What's one of the ways in which life is difficult and different in Nepal? So oh, in terms of that, that would be the creatures that are surrounding me at all times. Um, there's a variety of those. I mean, from mosquitoes and spiders the size of my face. And I have like a big face. I'm a big girl. So these are big spiders, just imagine. Um, but probably the biggest ones to get used to are the rats. Um, there are rats everywhere in Nepal, especially in the village, because there's really no way to keep them out. Um, the rats outnumber the people in the village and definitely outnumber me in my house. Um, I have rat Olympics at night up above my bed on the plywood and oh yeah. I have two rooms in my house and one of them is my room and one of them is the rat's room. It's the room where I cook and store my food and where the rats live. I keep all of that out of my other space so that the rats will stay gone, but it's a losing battle. And we have them here in Kathmandu too, but I have fewer in my house in Kathmandu. Like only occasionally do they make their way in here. So. The other one you were talking about was the flying cockroaches. Um, and those are three-ish inches long, um, almost impossible to kill. They're like stomping a squirrel when you try to step on one. <laughs> and then it just makes them angry. They don't usually die. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's a fun place. Wow. Um, and th these rats, I know you recently raised a project on donor C for a cabinet. What, what were they doing to this stuff and what's in the cabinet? Well, so I have, um, I'm part of a women's group. There are eight women who make washable, reusable, eco-friendly sanitary pad kits. And so those are cloth, right? Those are sanitary pads that are made out of cloth. There's liners and pads and everything is washable and reusable. Um, the production center is just a tin shelter, basically. Um, we have thrown something down on the ground, but in essence, it's a dirt floor with something laid on top of it. Um, it's not completely sealed. The roof is a hovering roof. There's a space on the bottom. Um, you know, there, it's staked in, but it's not built into the ground. There's no foundation. So it's open in many different ways and areas. So the rats come in and without having something like a really tight ceiling metal cabinet, the rats just have free access to all of that material that we have purchased and brought to the village from Kathmandu. 
Um, and then, of course, they use it for bedding and they use it for whatever rats use stuff for. I guess I don't know exactly, but like for fun, for entertainment, you know, it's like Disneyland. It's Rat Disneyland in our production center. Um, so we need to be able to protect that stuff so that we don't lose all of that material and those kits. So we make these pad kits um, in bulk and then we store them in these cabinets and we distribute them for free to the girls in the schools um, when it's time. So That's great. And what's the impact on these kits for the, uh, the girls in the school? Like why are you bothering doing this? Yeah, it's a really good question because it's something that in the West we take for granted. We're just used to this and it's, you know, it, it's something that no one gives much thought to. But in Nepal, it's kind of a complicated beast. There's a few parts of it, so I won't get into all of it, but one part is that there is a lot of myth surrounding menstruation. Um, and they think of it as a curse, literally a curse. They don't realize it happens to every girl and woman across the planet. They think often that it's um, something that happens because of something you've done in a past life. It's a punishment, like that's where the curse came from. So this is from past sins that have followed you into this life that have caused you to have to do this thing. So it makes you unclean and ceremonially unclean. So you can't go, you can't draw water, you can't cook uh, food, you can't go to the temple or do worship. You know, there's lots of different things that is disallowed um, because of that. And so we do education to try to dispel that myth and let people know that this is a healthy body process and something that is important for fertility. If you want to have children, you know, that this is a sign of a healthy body. This is a good thing. This is a gift. So we start there. And then the other issue is the ability to um, manage their menstruation because of lack of resources. So they either don't have money to buy products or they don't have products at home that they can use. So they worry about leakage. Um, there's also this ceremonially unclean thing going on. So um, most of the girls stay home for multiple days every month because of their period, um, because of these issues. And so as a result, they miss up to two months of school every year just from period days alone. So then they're missing two months of an already poor, government village education, which affects their ability to pass their exams and affects their ability to move on in school. And if they can't move on in school, then they don't have a hope of getting um, a higher education or a better job so that they can actually um, provide for themselves and their families. That puts them at high risk for going abroad, looking for work, um, and that puts them at risk for human trafficking and exploitation and lots of other things. So by simply giving them something, that allows them to manage their period during those days so no one has to know they're on it and they don't have to worry about leaking and things like that, allows them to go to school two months more a year and that in turn um, helps keep them in school and just helps with their future. So all of this is part of this program. So just by donating money for these pad kits, we're able to support a women's group who makes income to make them and then we're able to support the girls' education. Wow, that is incredible, Corinne. Um, and you're addressing a really downstream, upstream issue that's going to affect so many things with their future, with their lives, their community, you know, breaking this perpetuation of a cycle. Yeah. Uh, that's great. How, how many girls and like communities have you been able to work with in the years since you've been in Nepal? Do you know? Yeah, it, that's a little hard to state for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, we have done a lot um, in the schools. I would say directly in the schools in the last even year to year and a half, we have probably, I have done the teaching and the dis distribution to probably maybe three or 400 girls. But we have also sold these pads at a wholesale cost to other organizations that are doing these education programs. So they don't have the ability to make the pads, but they will go into different districts and do the teaching and the distribution. So we've actually had another probably three or 400 that have been served that way. And this year when school reopens, um, we plan to distribute and train 700 girls before the school year's over. Wow. Um, and this, this, you mentioned the girls. Can you tell me a bit more about the women in your women's center or women group? Oh, they're great. I love my women's group. 
Um, yeah, there's nine. Well, there started out to be nine. There's now eight because one got a job somewhere else. She got married and moved and got a job somewhere else. Um, so that was a success story too. Um, but these women have been with us for about three years now. We gave them three months of tailoring training to start, just general tailoring training so that they would have the ability to have a skill that they could use to either make their own clothes or things for the home or for someone else. Um, and then after that, we trained them to make these washable, reusable, eco-friendly sanitary pad kits that we can then um, employ them to make. They make a really good wage. It's higher than Nepali minimum wage. There is a minimum wage in Nepal that is rarely actually met by anyone, um, but we make sure that we exceed that. So they make a really good wage working for us. And it's really been helpful for these women. It's been helpful not only for income, but also just in empowerment and in their confidence level. Um, you know, these women also do some of the education on menstruation. They go house to house in the villages and they teach every girl and woman in the village about menstruation and they distribute the pads that way as well. And one of the ladies said to me, she's never been to school a day in her life. She's completely illiterate, which over half of our women's group is completely illiterate. Um, but we have given them picture brochures and training and taught them to do this teaching. And she said, I didn't know I could learn much less teach. I had no idea I could be a teacher. And she thought because she'd not gone to school, she didn't know how to learn. And we had to tell her like, look at all the things you know how to do in your life. Like I would literally die if I had to live here alone without the help of all of you, you know, the things that you know, but now they've just grown into themselves and, and they really are a shining example of, hard work and work ethic and working together. They work together across caste lines, across education lines and income lines and all of those things. And they work together in a way that's really rare here. So, but financially it is helping them. Um, one of them is sending her two children to higher education right now. So she's able to pay for schooling with this money. Another one of our women's husbands actually committed suicide um, two years ago now, not quite a year and a half ago. So this became the only income for their family. So that's been really helpful oh, for her. And then another lady lost her home um, in the earthquakes in 2015. And they did not qualify for any help from the government or anything like that. And so they've been living in a dirt floor tin shelter since 2015 um, with no way to rebuild their house. And she's now using this money, not only from our group, but she took her tailoring training and she opened up her own tailoring shop as well in the village. And so um, we have another business group that we teach women how to do that with. So she's now building her house with the money she's making. So this has been a really, really great program. And all the credit goes to them. They're working really, really hard. So. That's great. And I admire how you, you've built these connections in your community, developed the relationships and are helping transform the lives. Like helping the girls is great. Helping these women is, is gonna have such a big impact too. I really, I believe in community and I believe in making a big difference in a small place rather than making a small difference all over the place. Um, and I could go and do this distribution in this pad program in a different village in a different district every day, but without follow up and without relationship, I don't know how much good that's going to do that tiny bit coming in, but we're in a community where we're working on women's health. We're working on employment opportunities. We're working on education. We're working on, family strengthening. We're working on all sorts of things that are making this entire community stronger and more resilient and more hopeful. Um, and so I think that even though it's a small village and we've been there for quite a while and we're doing most of our programs there, it is making a really big impact. And I, I feel really strongly about that. So, and because of that, we're not doing this program at them. There is ownership. And so this is something that they are invested in and it's their program and I just help manage it. That's great. How often does your women's group get together? Like how often, apart from lockdown, do you get to like see and interact with them? Because that big impact in a small place is such a beautiful model. Well, I generally live in the village. So I usually see them on a daily basis. Now, if we're, if we're producing, I work with them every day from beginning of production time till the end. And I don't draw a salary or anything from that. Um, I'm just there to help and to be part of the group. Um, but we work hard and um, I see them daily. If we don't have a production going on at the time, then we meet usually about once a week. 
Um, and there's that also many of those women also participate in our basic of business program and they're learning how to start their own small businesses um, alongside their tailoring work. And so we, 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 sorry, we meet weekly as well for the basic of business class. So you're seeing them once, twice, or every day. Um, that's great. Uh, what's, what's your vision for the future, Corinne? Like, you've, you've had a rock star start on Donor Seat. You've raised close to 1500 in the past five, six days. Um, and I think that's a testament to the amount of need there is and the richness of support community you found on Donor C and you're bringing from your own community. But what, what's next? That's a good question and a hard question. Um, I, I'm going to bring up my faith because I do have a faith base and that's the reason for what I do. That's my motivation for what I do. So I don't like to work under my own agenda. I like to leave myself open to God's agenda, to what I feel like I'm being led to do or what I'm being called to do. So I don't like to put too many constraints on it. I don't like to have too many solid plans, if that makes sense, because then I'm working towards my own plan and my own agenda. And I'm often not open to seeing how things are going or how it's being led. Also in a place like Nepal, it's really hard to have solid plans because they will constantly change and that gets really frustrating. So I have kind of bigger, just general goals. Um, I mean, my goal is to be not needed, certainly in the village. I wanna be wanted and I wanna be part of the community, but I wanna be not needed. So um, the goal is to have these programs blossom and develop to a point where these women can actually do these things on their own without my, my help as a foreigner. Um, so that would be one goal. I also have a vision of just branching out to some neighboring communities. So not starting in a completely different place, but in some nearby villages where we share some family members, some church members, and, and just help them to start what we have going already in our village because it is a good model it is making a difference and they're seeing that on the outside. So we would like to be able to um, branch out and just start something similar, women's groups and girls groups. We also have something called the Beauty Within Girls Club. Um, so that's in the schools and young girls get together and learn all sorts of lovely things about themselves and others. So I would just like to see that flourish and to be able to help that happen. But I wanna be a facilitator. I don't wanna be the one that is starting or doing everything. Um, also, one of my projects on Donor C was for me paying it forward to another organization. I was so happy with the response that um, we had 100 pad kits funded for our program. So I wanted to raise money to give 100 pad kits to another organization for them to use in their work. Um, so that's something else I would like to do is to be able to just have enough success with the fundraising that I can be generous with those that are having a harder time raising what they need to do their work especially the Nepali groups. It's very hard to raise money within Nepal, um, from Nepalis by Nepalis, and so they have amazing dreams, amazing vision, and often almost no resources to work with. And so it's really nice to be able to give back to those people that I partnered with and, and help them to be able to do their programs more easily. That's inspiring. And um, having that deep mission and sensitivity to call and be not knowing what the future is having and adapting is I can't wait to see where that leads you uh, and plays into the quote that's behind you uh, that's beautiful you, you mentioned when we first met the story behind it uh, you mind recounting that here sure so this is Isaiah 61 1 which is my life and ministry verse and was my life and ministry verse long before I came to Nepal and as you know, I have a heart for justice and for freedom and for human trafficking. So as you can see up higher, there is a bird cage that is open with those birds that have been let out, like to signify the release from captivity and freedom. Um, so this has been my guiding force for the last, you know, at least since 2014 or longer. I had a roommate living with me, someone who needed a place to stay for about eight months while she was in transition who had more talent than money, um, which is great. It worked out fine. I had plenty of money at the time. And so I had her pay me instead of 
rent, I had her pay me by painting this. So I designed it. She painted it. She's a brilliant artist. And now I have this lovely wall behind me. I have this perfect backdrop for Zoom calls. <laughs> it's great. And speaking of design, uh, I saw your guitar when you just swung the camera around and your, your sleeves. Uh, I, I love your aesthetic. <laughs> How would you describe yourself like artistically? Total off the wall question. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Well, I have way more creativity than talent. So unfortunately, I'm like the one that wants to be an artist, but really I'm not like I want to be a musician, but I kind of suck. So I really have all of those interests. I'm just not that good at them. But I'm an idea girl. Um, I'm the creative girl, you know, the visionary. Um, I have kind of a slightly hippie, slightly bohemian kind of feel to me um, that I've always had. I come from a place in Kansas that is the only place in Kansas that's not like Kansas. It's called Lawrence. It's a college town. Um, people liken us to like Austin, Texas, or some of those places to Boulder. It's got a music scene, an art scene. Everybody is tattooed and pierced and, you know, weird and fun um, and mixed in with rednecks, you know, like we've got a little bit of everything, but it's definitely a cultural melting pot. Um, so I, I brought that vibe out of Kansas with me to Nepal. So. Wow, Kurt, I love it. And how, I mean, <laughs> How did the Nepalese respond to you, a, a tall blonde woman who's gregarious, creative, and just like transforming perceptions about female health and communities? Like, I'll say, at first it was like, God has a sense of humor. Like I am the opposite of Nepali, right? Like I am six feet tall. Like you said, I'm kind of blonde and bigger than life and you know, outgoing. And like, I am just not your typical Asian, let's put it that way. Um, and I thought I will never fit in, right? Like this is going to be awful. There was part of me that thought I'm always going to look like the foreigner and the outsider and whatever. I mean, and that is true, but my differences are so extreme that they are drawn to me. Like Nepalis that I've never met, I've never seen, I've never talked to, will come to me, they'll touch me, they'll talk to me. They're like, they're fascinated by how I look. I worked very hard to learn to speak the language when I moved here. So I am extremely functional in the Nepali language now. So when they come to me because I'm so different and then I speak their language to them, they're shocked. And then they're absolutely delighted. And like, that is the thing that bonds us together. So now they're like, you're, they always say to me like, you're Nepali on the inside, but you're foreign on the outside. And so I was in the village not long ago and I, we were having a conversation and someone said, well, you're half Nepali. You're, and that's what they said, your inside half is Nepali, your outside half is foreign. So I thought if I'm going to need to be broken down into half and half, I like the inside and the outside half. The other really cool thing about my height that God just used in kind of a beautiful way, um, after the earthquakes, they were horrible. And, and so 9,000 people died in 2015 in the earthquakes. My district was one of the ones that was the most decimated. So we had about 350 households at the time, I believe. Um, and every house but two was completely destroyed. So my house and the pastor's house were the only two houses in the entire village left standing. Um, so everything fell. The cell towers fell. There was no Wi-Fi. There was no way to reach anyone after the earthquakes. And I had no idea if they were alive or dead. Like it was, it was awful. They were completely cut off. There was a huge landslide that had happened that cut the road off to that district as well. So no one could get to them. Um, it, there was also another landslide at the China border. So China couldn't get to them. Nepal couldn't get to them. And they were basically cut off. I spent five days trying to get to that village after the earthquakes. I tried to charter a helicopter. I tried to get on fields. We tried to walk. Like, it took me five days. Long story short, five days later, I reached the village. And I was the first person from the outside to get there after the earthquakes. So I kind of come up over the hill and, like, I find all of these people that are kind of in this clearing and they've set up some shelters and they're all shell-shocked. They all knew me because I had been only a couple of weeks before had I gotten my house there. So I had secured where I was going to live. I had paid for it, I visited, and then I left. And a week later, the earthquakes came. Five days after that, I made it back. And they said, like, why are you here? You know, like, wow, like here I just came over the hill. And, and you know, I said, 
this is my home now. You know, you're my friends, you're my family. Like I worried about you and I wanted to come and make sure you're okay. And so people just started to come and cling to me. And like, they're all this tall, right? So like, and at the time I didn't really speak in Nepali that well, they're crying and they're telling me their stories and I'm just like kissing them on top of the head and I'm hugging them and I'm crying with them. And then another one would like peel off and another one would come. And I stood there for probably close to two hours with all of these people from the village just taking turns coming and holding on to me, right? So I'm probably gonna cry when I tell this story. So one of my friends says, that's why God made you so big. He said, because you are strength to them, like your power, you're safe. You, you know, you have come and like they are coming to you to cling on to you for their sense of security and their sense of safety. And like, that's, that's why you are who you are, you know? So never begrudge your big self because my big self was planted here in Nepal to give comfort to 350 people in the village. So. That is a beautiful story. Thank you. I am glad you've leaned into how you've been made and that you've been able to relate to the village. I didn't realize you were as fluent now than as you were. And I love the being half Nepali. <laughs> you look it. Uh, <laughs> I know, I feel it. <laughs> There's a phrase you've said at the end of some of your videos. What is it? I, I don't. Uh, what it's in Nepali, and I, I assume it's a thank you. It's a goodbye. Oh, it's some... not, well, it probably said "deri deri danyabad" or something like that. So "danyabad" is thank you. Um, I also sometimes will say "namaskar" or "namaste," which is also kind of the Nepali greeting. I also often say "God bless you" or "thanks in advance." <laughs> <laughs> I can understand the confusion. Uh, I also wonder how many times you've said washable, reusable, sanitary, eco-friendly pad kits. Eco-friendly, washable, reusable, sanitary pad kits. There we I go. I have to get the right order or I get confused. I throw mm. myself out my life. What just happened? <laughs> Once people get to know me and I've done enough of the pad projects, then I can just say the pads or the kits. But I figure I have to lay that groundwork for a little while. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anywhere else we can like learn about who you are? Do you have a blog, a vlog, a, a website or anything else? Or is this- I used to corner? have a blog, but life is just so busy anymore that like, and I kind of transitioned to Facebook. So most of my funny stories get on Facebook instead. And I'm, I'm writing a book. So someday a book will come out. Um, I've got about 79 pages of that down so far. So sooner or later, there will be some kind of a weird random memoir book for my life, but. Um, yeah, no, right now, this is kind of it. So. Well, you're doing great work. I look forward to reading the book. And Thank you. It, it's great to see you on Donor Sea and to see the projects that you're supporting, Corinne. Like, you are helping transform lives in a community in a sustainable manner that is beautiful. And so using your talents and abilities that I find inspiring. Aww, thank you. Donor seems dangerous for me because not only am I supporting my own projects, but then I end up supporting other people's projects mm. because there's so many amazing things on there. And like, so you bring something with like a, a wiggling puppy my way or something and I'm, yeah, I'm likely to give to that. So I do notice that a lot of the donor seed donors are ones that have their own projects. Like we're all giving to each other, which is pretty special, I think, so. It's something I love about donor seed is we're not just enabling individual aid workers and change agents around the world. We're also connecting them to each other and helping form those, those bonds and communities. And I appreciate you connecting with Stephen Pushka and, and like other people in your own network where together we can accomplish so much and like it can be isolating work to be in a village or in, in a foreign city alone. Um, and or, or rather, there are lots of people, but not people of your own same background yeah. and, and, and history and, and, and passions. Uh, or so language. Just, yeah. So that's really tricky. Yeah. 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 It does make you feel more connected. And, and it just gives hope because sometimes, you know, these problems that we're tackling are big. And these are ones that have gone back millennia, you know, in some cases. And so this is not something we can change overnight. And sometimes we don't see any change. Sometimes our failures are greater than our successes. Like this is a difficult thing to do and we show all the happy side, but it's hard work. And a lot of times you get to feeling like you're fighting this battle alone. Like you're the only one that cares about, 
human trafficking or girls or women or, you know, these types of things, equal rights. And then to see and start tapping into a community where everyone has the same heart and everyone is fighting the same fight, it really gives hope. And you realize, oh no, I am, I'm not an army of one. Like I am part of this global army of people that are fighting the good fight, you know, that are fighting for justice or equality or whatever it is. And so um, I find that really inspiring and it helps keep me going too, because I don't feel like I can't do it alone and I can't. And if it was just me in the world doing this, I should just give up because that would be silly. But all of us together can actually make a pretty big ripple. Yeah, and it's beautiful to see how our, our donors are joining in on that. Like to be a army of, of people working in the field and helping would not be possible without their support and generosity. And like the, one of the other things I love about donor seeds, it's not one large donor uh, or donor couple who's writing a check and funding whole budgets. Like, these projects are typifying what it looks like for a neighborhood to come together and say, hey, so-and-so needs help. I'm going to give what I have and somebody else is going to give what they have and we're going to all be able to share in this success uh, in, in this effort. Well, and so to give you just an example, yesterday I had a Nepali friend. I would have worked alongside him to do some projects, but he himself is out of job right now. Um, he's no longer has an income. He's actually planning on going back to school. And he saw one of my programs on DonorSee. Um, he does not have a credit card or an ability to donate online, but he sent me a message and said, hey, I want to give towards the PAD project. I believe in this. And so can you help me make that happen? And so he's giving me, you know, the equivalent of $5, but to them, that's a, a that's probably the equivalent of 50 to a hundred dollars for somebody in the U S you know, on a regular salary. And he doesn't even have an income and yet he's giving towards this program. And so, um, you know, it's not just foreigners trying to do things in these countries either. This is somebody from within his own country that wants to help and didn't have a way to do it didn't know about it, didn't have a platform and wants to give. And so we're going to make that happen for him. That's inspiring. And I'm working with you on that. <laughs> Corinne, this has been so great. Um, I'm sure if people have more questions, they can just ask you Q&A on your donancy profile, reach out to you on Facebook. Uh, is there anything else you'd want people to know if they're just landing on your profile for the first time? Gosh. No, I don't know. Like that, like you said, I, I would say just encourage them to ask a question. I'm happy to answer anything. I'm really a very open person. Um, I really like to connect. I'll, I'll give you more information than you ever wanted to know. So watch what you ask for. But I would just encourage people to really reach out. Like I'd love to know what they're thinking, what they want to know, and, and I'd be happy to provide it. So. Well, that's great. Uh, I'll let you get back to your evening. But Oh, I do want them to know one thing. Oh. My face is not always doing this. <laughs> on every one of my emails, like I start out smiling and I give it like a five second smile so that it can choose that. And on every single video, it's like, no, no, let's do face recognition for what she's doing this. And that is on every one of my videos. And so I want them to know that my face does not always do that. So. It's a great face. <laughs> I have some great looks. They don't all look like that. And they one in every, it looks like the same video 12 times. Oh my. <laughs> I love your laughter. This is great. <laughs> all right. Take care. Thank you.